Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Masha Pradanovic. I am the program director of SIAM Activity Group on Geosciences. So welcome to our uh, webinar series, particularly our uh, May talk. And the talk will be given by Dr. Mikhail Zeslavsky on reduced order modeling and inversion for large scale problems of geophysical exploration. Now, before I give the floor uh, to Dr. Zeslavsky, I will just go over a couple of announcements um, by uh, our activity group. Uh, so just uh, as always, you can engage with SIAM on SIAM Engage platform. Um, and there's also websites where you can uh, read various announcements. We do have a SIAM Wiki page. It's pretty basic, but it does have all of the required information. I would. I always uh, mention this, so I will keep doing it. <laughs> um, if you are a student, there is a way to uh, get a free membership uh, uh, in science. So please use that opportunity. In addition to webinars, conferences for science, there's various uh, ways to network and also um, get feedback on, for instance, uh, in your interview skills uh, and so forth. So definitely uh, take an opportunity of engage, engaging with SIAM and also SIAM student chapters. Now, um, you can always contact uh, officers, our chair, Inga Bere, vice chair, Vladimir Drushkin, uh, myself, or uh, secretary, Chris Keys. Uh, you're easily findable, so please don't hesitate to email us with any suggestions, including which speakers would you like to see in our next season. Uh, we also are pleased to announce, this is the first official <laughs> announcement uh, from SIAM, so this slide is getting its first go in public. Uh, so we will have, we will have um, a next conference in 2023 from June 10, uh, 19th to 22nd in Bergen, Norway. So it is now time, good time to start thinking about any mini symposium proposals um, that you would like to submit. The deadline uh, will be in November, November 21st, and we will uh, make sure to remind you of these deadlines. Uh, and then also if uh, you would like uh, travel support, it is also a good time to put this on your calendar that this early December is the deadline for applications, especially if you're a student or early career researcher. And then after that uh, in December, there will, be, um, there will be an abstract deadline. So start thinking about it. And we are hoping that this is going to be an in-person conference. Um, so before I uh, let uh, Dr. Saslavsky uh, give his talk, um, I will just also remind you that there, uh, the seminar will be recorded uh, and posted on uh, YouTube. Um, during the, the, the talk, uh, feel free to use either chat or Q&A uh, to uh, pose the questions. Question, at the end, I will, if you are okay with that, I will unmute you to ask that question or I will ask the question for you. That is really uh, up to you. You can also use chat to just say hi and connect with everybody. Um, and this is our last talk of this season. All of the others you can find uh, recorded on SIAM YouTube um, and we will then resume in October, 2022. Now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mikhail Zaslavsky. He is the principal researcher of Schlumberger Doll uh, uh, Research, but he also has uh, a regular visiting appointment <laughs> with Brown University and Institute for Computational um, and Applied Mathematics. Uh, there he holds a PhD uh, in uh, applied mathematics from uh, Moscow State University and has uh, specialized in numerical linear algebra, reduced order modeling, uh, inverse methods, and so forth, specifically applied to geophysical uh, exploration. So without further ado, uh, I will stop sharing my slides and please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Masha. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And thanks for inviting me uh, to present. So um, at first, I'd like to acknowledge. Um, so you see my slides, right? Yes. 
<laughs> so um, first, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Liane Borsche from University of Michigan, Vladimir Druskin, my former colleague from Plumberge, but he's currently with WPI, uh, Alex Mamono from University of Houston, Shari Moscow from Drexel University, and Jorn Zimmerling, who is currently with University of Michigan, but soon he will be joining Uppsala University in Sweden. Um, so um, the talk will be mostly about uh, application to geophysical exploration, which is the main business of Schlumberger, the company I work for. So uh, depending on the um, on geophysical exploration, we want uh, to uh, get some information regarding uh, the formations below the Earth's surface. So it, and that information can be obtained uh, from the measurement, from interpretation of the measurements. Uh, of different nature. So one of the uh, measurements are seismic or acoustic signals, which are basically one can uh, consider uh, like source, which is kind of small explosion. Then the wave propagates uh, below the Earth's surface or in, inside the Earth's surface and reflects from the some heterogeneities from the boundaries and part of it is reflected, part of it propagates uh, further and reflects again. And then the, the, the field is recorded at some other position at the re receivers. And according to that measurement by, from its interpretation, we want to get some information what's essentially below the Earth's surface. So the type of acquisition can be surface seismic, which is typically used on the early stage of exploration of the oil field, a uh, particular oil field, when both surface, uh, both, so both sources and receivers, um, they are located on, on the earth ground. And um, other types of uh, acquisition, so it can be a borehole, where uh, it's already, uh, when the oil field already mature, when there are a lot of uh, boreholes drilled already in the oil field. So in this case, we can deploy source, sources and receivers put, and put them uh, inside the borehole and uh, to get information what's essentially near a particular well, well bore. Other type of signals can be uh, electromagnetic signals. In this case, the sources are uh, emit some elect electromagnetic waves. Uh, wave again propagates through the, uh, uh, through the formations, reflects from the boundaries, and then the electromagnetic field is recorded uh, at other positions at receivers. So depending on what we want to um, obtain, depending on the formation, so seismic, uh, acoustic, and electromagnetic signals that are typically sensitive to one formation and insensitive to others. So depending on the applications and on the formations, one uh, measurement can be beneficial compared to others. So other types of acquisition setups, which is not shown in this picture, can be, say, surface to borehole, when, say, uh, sources are located on surface and receivers are located on the borehole, or another way around, borehole to surface, or uh, magnetic telurics, uh, where uh, the source is essentially our sun. What's interesting, actually, so that magnetic telurics, one of the inventors is uh, the same Tikhonov we many of us used to hear from uh, regularization techniques, but it's the same guy who, who considered to be one of the inventors of magnetic telurics method. So uh, if we want to consider uh, mathematical formulation of the problems we just mentioned, so we accept uh, magnetic telurics. So uh, the sources can be considered as like point, point sources, which is, can be approximated, say, by delta functions. And uh, our formation, I assume we um, have a set of parameters, which we denoted by P. Uh, which describes our formation it can be a small number of parameters where we can um, assume that it's kind of parametric description well, uh, of uh, our medium, or it can be, say, continuous function of uh, free variables, like uh, if we uh, don't discretize anything and we don't uh, have any particular small set of parameters to describe the formation. So then, uh, uh, depending on the parameters, we have um, like, uh, operators 
AFP, which is assume it's at this point self-adjoint, a negative definite operator, and in the frequency domain, our equations under consideration can be uh, formulated in this uh, form. So where lambda is some spectral parameter outside of the spectrum of operator A of P. So BI are our sources, UI are our solutions, uh, A of P being our operator. And that in the if we transform it in the time domain, so we obtain this uh, formulation here, where uh, depending on alpha, it's uh, either diffusive type of diffusive nature, when alpha is equal to one or weak propagation nature uh, when alpha is equal to two. So A of P can be considered as an operator acting on space of continuous function, or it can be also considered as a, if we already have uh, filled out A of P, we can discretize it on fine enough grid. So it can be considered as a matrix of significantly large, uh, of large enough dimension, and that's why we just use the same notation, like linear algebraic jargon, so that you transpose V is considered to be like conventional inner product in the discrete space, or it can be considered as an inner product uh, if U and V are um, continuous functions. So we use the same notation, you, you, you transpose V, just for, just for brevity. And the same for matrices, so when U and V are matrices, we transpose U is a uh, M1 by M2 matrices with components VI transpose UJ. So, um, examples here, uh, as I mentioned, so we want to solve either electromagnetic field, ele electromagnetic problems, or say seismic or acoustic problems. In the case of Maxwell equation for electromagnetic problems in the low frequency regime, that A of sigma can be uh, considered in this form. E is electric field, sigma is uh, our electrical conductivity. Mu is uh, magnetic permeability, but uh, in our application, we consider it to be constant, so only sigma is varying. So in this case, in the frequency domain form can be expressed in this uh, formulation and in the time domain formulation uh, has this form here. So in the seismics, I want to um, emulate simulate uh, elastic wave propagation, where here lambda is an uh, elastic modular tensor, rho is density, u uh, in the displacement formulation, it's just displacement. So, and we want to um, simulate the wave propagation according to the Plama equations written here. So, um, in our setup, we even, uh, if we have, um, and the operator in our hand, we're not interested in the solution in the entire domain, we're only interested, as I mentioned, in the solution where we perform our measurements only at receiver positions. So we're not, uh, but in the uh, inverse problem, that's the only data we have. So we don't know the solution again in the entire domain of computation, but only at particular where like scattered points where uh, we have uh, our receivers, where we put our receivers. So essentially, in other words, we're interested not in the solution of our problems, U, I, F, lambda, but at inner product with some uh, vectors Rj, which are sort of approximation of delta functions located at receiver positions. So that's so-called transfer functions, multi-input, multi-output transfer function, multi-input meaning that we have multiple sources, multi-output uh, means that we have multiple receivers. So, in the forward problem, uh, under known formation parameters P, we want to compute our data for a range of lambda. That's important. So, we, not only for one lambda, not only for one spectral parameter, but for a range of lambdas. So, uh, and data is represented by our transfer function, multi input, multi output transfer function for uh, all sources and receivers, IJ. The, uh, sources and receiver numbers, and for a range of lambda. And inverse problem, it's another way around. So we just want under known data, D of lambda recorded particular, due to particular sources and particular, we measured at particular receivers. So we want to reconstruct 
medium parameters p. On traditional approach, so it's um, this problem, the inverse problem is solved by uh, an optimization framework. So we want to uh, find p star, which delivers the minimum of this functional cost function, cost function regularized, which is a regularized data misfit invented by the same Tikhonov as uh, I mentioned from magnetic telurics. Um, so, um, principle, the problem is well formulated. So, but what are the challenges there? First of all, one challenge comes from the side of the problem. So, in typically in electromagnetic problems, we deal with the problem of size easily several millions. But if we want to do seismic, size, size of the problem can go up to billions easily. So, that's for forward problems uh, and for inverse problems. So we, since the problem is solved in optimization framework, that forward problems has to be solved multiple times, right, in the in the iterative framework. That's kind of quite expensive, and moreover, the pro, since the problem is highly non-convex, number of these iterations can be actually one or two. It can be uh, tens or hundreds easily. So, at the same time, the goal is uh, to obtain the solution. In quite quite fast and sometimes in real time. For example, I assume we build a borehole, right? And want to make this want to have a decide where to drill further, right? Want to make this such a decision. Do measurements, look what's nearby, say using, for example, electromagnetic signals, and want to interpret them as quickly as possible in order to avoid any delay, because any delay costs money, right? Um, that has to be done in real time. And that's one of the key challenges. So essentially the, uh, the goal of today's presentation will be how to speed up both forward solution and reduced or, uh, sorry, and inverse problem solution using uh, the techniques from reduced order modeling. So what it is. So that's uh, just a general slide, general. Uh, overview of uh, reduced other models in a nutshell. So essentially, if we have a full scale problem written here, and want to, we're not interested in the solution U, um, but we're only interested in the transfer function, which is our measurements, uh, which assumes at this point that your sources coincide with receivers. So, Typically, it was R, right, receivers here, but I assume at this point they do coincide. So um, instead of solving the full scale problem, we want to replace it by small size problem. But that, uh, so we want to get down from uh, infinite dimensionality, infinite dimensional problem or some large problem of large dimension to the problem of significantly smaller dimension, how smaller we'll see later. Such a way that although the solution U may be not accurate, but the transfer function F is accurate enough. So basically we want to replace the full scale problem by small scale problem, such a way that the small scale problem uh, mimics the full scale transfer function accurately enough. That's the message. So there are two types of problems. So one depending on the application, one is beneficial compared to the other. So one of them is model driven reduced order model when we do now the operator A of P exactly. So that's typically the case when we want to. Uh, do simulation when we want to do forward so when we want to solve forward problem. And in, in this case, or if we want to solve the inverse problem in optimization framework. So and the other types of problems, uh, other type of reduced other models, so-called data driven, when we don't have access to the, our operator A of P, for example, we don't know P. We have some idea how A looks like, but we don't know P. We don't know medium parameters. We don't have access to the entire operator P. So the only thing we do now is our transfer function measured at some points, lambda ones on lambda, some frequency, 
uh, set of frequencies. So in the question here, under uh, if we now only f of lambda, how can we construct small scale system of, of this form such that it reproduces like physical physical meaning, like small scale system such that it reproduces the uh, trans, uh, our data, our transfer function. So that's so-called data-driven reduced order model. So difference between these two dimensions. So if in the first one, we do know the operator A, and P, in the second one, we don't know operator of P, we know only data. So typically, uh, just a remark here, so when we hear reduced order model for inversion, it typically refers to constructing uh, kind of uh, surrogate of forward solver map right and plug it in into inv an optimization framework so the same essentially the same optimization framework but the true forward solution replaced by reduced order model solution that's kind of valid way to proceed but in this talk we'll we'll make one step further and we'll show how just directly from the data construct reduced order model and infer the medium formation parameters directly from the reduced order model without any optimization sorry, without any optimization so basically the message is here here is how to get some information directly from reduced order model uh, under um knowledge that the reduced term model comes from this particular PD, right? Uh, with unknown parameter P and how to get some information regarding P directly from that. So let's start with some model problem. We'll uh, have this model problem throughout the entire presentation, but it's kind of simple. So it's just one dimensional vibration of string with density rho and tension sigma. Um, but it sort of has physical meaning, right? Because it's one dimensional uh, wave propagation problem. Mm -hmm. If I assume that uh, left, uh, hands, uh, left hand side, um, left end, so, uh, sorry, right end is fixed. And left at left end, we just put some uh, force, right? So put some source term. And, and, uh, um, and we consider it on the segment from zero to one. So I assume that our measured data is precisely that this uh, solution, displacement u at the uh, left end, x equal to zero. So this problem can be formulated in our form, uh, a, of, a of u plus lambda u equal to b. And transfer function, our measurement is given by B transpose u, so B can be considered as just a vector with all zeros except the first component, which is equal to one. So um, let's start with uh, model-driven reduced order models. So quite simple. So we uh, instead of full-scale model, we consider it Galerkin projection onto subspace V. So everybody heard of Galerkin projection, right? Typically from finite element method when we project on some uh, head functions and uh, similar um, subspace. <coughs> Here we just follow slightly different um, approach in terms of choice of subspace. Here we projected onto now let's consider projection into this uh, subspace, which is spent on solution of our equation for our equation here, right? For set of lambdas equal to L1, so on, so on Ln, right? So it's, we project on the solution uh, sample uh, of our equation, sample that uh, points L1, so on Ln. So and approximated like. Uh, as a uh, linear combination of these vectors from uh, matrix V with some unknown coefficients U tilde. This U tilde, as I mentioned, are computed from Galerkin framework, um, which is shown here. 
That's why the projected system has this form. <clears throat> and f of fn of lambda, which is like approximation of our true transfer function, can be written in this form. So um, what are the properties here? Properties, first of all, we obtain that um, our transfer function is approximated at points L1, uh, at our points, at our sampling points, as well as its derivative. So it essentially represents by the Hermit interpolation, inter interpolation. Thanks to that, so we obtain spectral, or which is linear or superlinear convergence that allows us to keep the size of the projection subspace and small enough. So essentially this side of the reduced order model will be quite small. How small? Will, will, there are, we have some certain theorems for that, but I, I better show numerical examples how small it can be. So then um, this um, function f of uh, fn, uh, approximate of the transfer function, can be computed uh, by eigendecomposition exactly, which is shown here. So it just shows that it, it is a rational approximate the true transfer function with uh, some poles and uh, residues, right? Theta and y. So, what's the cost of doing that? The cost of doing that is uh, essentially computation of our projection subspace because this eigen decomposition is its cost is quite small, right? So it's like eigen decomposition of small matrix, but we do need to compute that subspace V, right? So, we need to solve. Uh, small n uh, forward problems, right, in order to compute it. Um, that's the major cost. That's why the nature of uh, task that appears here is how to minimize this n, the number of n, for given accuracy. That's um, that the problem was solved in these papers. So it, um, basically, so that choice so it is so if we are targeted to the uh, entire frequency range from zero to from lambda from zero to infinity or alternatively if we are targeted to um, solution of time domain problem for all times this choice of shifts is actually real so that parameters are real and then um so what what's the benefit of doing that so essentially if we transform it the time domain problem, it can be considered as an optimal method among all time stepping methods and all Fourier, Fourier transform methods. So basically, this choice, this projection formulation, Galerkin projection formulation for uh, optimal choice of the shifts, can be considered as optimal among all these methods. So that's uh, for model based uh, reduced order model. Let's uh, can move to data driven reduced order model. So in the projected system here, so it has this form that difference between data driven and model driven, as I mentioned. So in the uh, model driven, we do have this access to the operator A and do, can compute projection subspace B, right? Projection matrix B. In the data driven, we only have data, right? F, uh, F of lambda. We have, don't know. A, and we, of course, cannot compute V, right, which is solution, right, of, of our, our equation for some set of lambdas. But we do need to compute that V transpose V and V transpose AV in order to construct reduced order model. That actually can be done only having true transfer function in hand. That's this rather simple formulas here, which shows how to compute elements V transpose V because um, this guy here is actually a solution. Um, this guy here, uh, so, sorry, this guy here is actually uh, one of the transfer functions. This guy here, another transfer function, right? And uh, the term here is actually element of V transpose V. So the message here, even if we don't know A and V, we can compute that projected matrices V transpose AV and V transpose V directly from the measured data. So if we have measurements at points L1, so on LN, we can compute these matrices here 
where V is solution for this um, pro, uh, for this frequencies L1, so on LM. Although we don't know solutions, we only have data. So um, the message, um, as I mentioned, uh, so we can compute it directly from the data. Here we considered a frequency domain problem, but uh, in our uh, in some of our uh, papers later on, we just generalized it to the measurements uh, that for, in the, for the time domain, we, for wave field time domain data that's has been done in this paper and our later developments. So essentially, it does allow us, so directly from the data, it does allow us to construct that reduce to other model and perform predictions of the data, right? For, uh, for all lambdas outside of our training set, uh, L1, so on LM, correct? So, but the next step is how to, so we essentially what we already considered as simulations, right? Modeling and data prediction. So the remaining step, the remaining problem I mentioned in the beginning is how to infer the model parameter directly from the uh, reduced order model. That uh, that will be done in the remaining part of uh, our talk. So the first observation here is that our uh, projection-based reduced order model can be, and transfer function, its transfer function can be um, represented as a it's one one to one mapping uh, can be represented as a transfer function of this equation here, which is uh, basically like one dimensional equation with uh, uh, response to mass and spring system, right? And um, some parameters gamma i hat and gamma i. So just once again, so directly from the data, we can construct this matrix matrices V transpose AV and V transpose V, again directly from the data, and can compute that Fn of lambda, right? Reduced to the model transfer function. The same Fn of lambda can be obtained as a transfer function of this equation with these boundary conditions here, where all these parameters gamma i hat and gamma i are pre precise, directly obtained from the data. So that can be performed by applying one more step, and which is Lanzer's process for this matrix pencil, V transpose AV, V transpose V. So that's just a scheme of what has been done. So have full large scale system. We don't know that because we have only data. We then we constructed a reduced order model for, of that system again directly from the data and then transform it to tridiagonal form. This guy, this thing is actually tridiagonal, right? Tridiagonal formulation, which precisely uh, preserves our reduced order model transfer function obtained here. And this this thing, as I mentioned, satisfies the interpolation term, but the Hermit interpolation condition, which essentially maps, so, sorry, matches the true transfer function as well as the derivative at uh, our interpolation points L1, so on LN. So, as I mentioned, so that system precisely corresponds to oscillator with masses and springs that uh, had been considered by Crane and Gantmacher in 1950s. So uh, that system, it, it already has a physical meaning, in it, right? So it's not just abstract linear system, abstract ma ma matrix pencil, we transpose AV and we transpose V. It has already physical meaning. That means we're sort of close to uh, our goal, right? In the, in, uh, the goal is to infer some medium parameter directly from the data, right? So when, when a, uh, that matrix pencil has um, is essentially no physical meaning, so this guy already does have it. So essentially, all the medium parameters are hidden somewhere 
these coefficients, gamma i hat and gamma i, correct? So um, that's what we'll be doing in, in the next few slides. Uh, but before proceed, proceed, uh, proceed there, so let me just briefly summarize how can we generalize it to uh, not to one source, but not to one dimensional problem when, when we have multiple sources multiple sources, multiple receivers. It can be done precisely the same way, but just uh, considering instead of one vector and one source, just consider uh, block block matrices, uh, like block um, sources and blo uh, as well as block solutions. So U tilde, uh, sorry, V, v uh, and capital V and uh, capital V essentially uh, this matrices here so um, this this guy is composed of solutions for this particular frequency for all sources right in, in matrix b and um, we just projected uh, the entire system into block subspace the formulas for uh, data driven reduced other model are precisely the same but the difference is just blocks here instead of just scalars and when we transform it to a mass spring system, it will be precisely the same form, but the difference is that masses and springs will be like blocks, not just single mass and single spring, that will be blocks of interconnected masses and springs, but the same kind of tridiagonal tri form. So the takeaway here, uh, directly from the data, we obtain reduced to the model of this form where this matrix A tilde is of, uh, represents sort of block mass and spring oscillator. So it already has sort of physical meaning as I mentioned. And the final step is how to obtain our parameters, medium parameters P from these masses and springs here. So essentially we need to separate grid part, greeting part, and coefficient part, and this, this guy is here, this guy's uh, gamma. For that purpose, we need to go back to our PDE. So our PDE uh, was, so our model PDE was uh, like this, right? So if we do uh, our little transform, right? so it can be reduced into this form, where sigma here and sigma here, it's the same sigma, right? So before we have um, sigma and rho, right? But if we do we transform, it will be the, the same sigmas here. So if we discretize it, discretize this equation after we transform on say three, three, uh, three point stencil, can be uh, written in this form, right? Just conventional three point discretization. And if we relate it to our uh, Crane's string written here, right? Pretty similar form, right? So the only difference is uh, this guy is denoted as gamma i hat, and this guy here denoted as gamma i. So it's, the same, so that these are parameters of crane strings, right? So, which is uh, okay directly from the data, we can get these parameters gamma i and gamma i hat, but that's twin parameters, right? If we have mm, uh, reduced order model of size n, but we do have actually four n parameters because. Uh, we want to uh, obtain four, four n parameters, which are grid steps h i and h i hat, and parameters sigma i and sigma i hat. Correct? How to get four n parameters out of two n parameters which that we obtain from the data gamma i hat and gamma i? That's the question. It can be done by training, by training of our embedding. So essentially, we do need to. Uh, consider some background where we now the parameters sigma and sigma uh, sigma i and sigma i hat for example they're all one right 
If we know these parameters, we uh, compute the data for it, obtain gamma i and gamma i hat, and it seems we know gamma i and gamma i hat for that background medium, and we know that sigma i hat uh, and sigma i are all one, we can obtain grid part, right? H i and H i hat. Then, uh, returning to our true data, that we when we know already our grid steps here, we can compute gamma i and gamma i hat, and then under known grid steps h i and h i hat, we can infer the medium, the, the parameter, the medium parameters sigma i and sigma i hat. So basically, kind of two stage process. So the first stage we do training for part known sigma i and sigma i hat and obtain grid parameters so h i and h i hat, and then we uh, after the training is performed, so we can infer about uh, medium parameters for our given data uh, using uh, just the same formulas, but already when grid parameters are known. So the question here that uh, comes into our mind, uh, what will happen if we use some different um, background data? Or, um, so in principle, the results can be different, right? But in a, we have shown that it, the result is actually slightly dependent on the choice of background, slightly dependent on the, that parameter. So in other words, in the limit case, the reconstruction of sigma and sigma I had will be the same. And note that this is performed on, only uh, using linear algebraic tools, no, no optimization, no fitting, no like which is popular now and reduced uh, in a neural network. Nothing is needed here. So only linear algebraic tools, not, no optimization. So once we know that parameters sigma i and sigma i hat, we can directly embed it into our continuous formulation in the, uh, our medium parameter because sigma i and sigma i hat are precise the medium parameters related to uh, the uh, to our grid nodes which are located with steps h i and h i hat remember if we consider the discretization here one, one, how it, how it came up with that so precisely from uh, um, Sigma uh, relating sigma i parameter sigma i to the ith node, and where uh, i h i is just a grid step for that node, right? So, okay, in other words, having uh, sigma i and sigma i hat as well as uh, h i and h i hat, we can embed that parameters into continuous medium, and that's uh, I plotted how the grid steps look like h i and h i hat. So um, stars are uh, nodes related to head, uh, head grid, uh, grid steps with head, and dots are nodes with um, related to HI, nodes with, without any head. So as I mentioned, different training set may yield to different grids. However, all of them are pretty close and converge to single grid when uh, the size of and side of reduced order model tends to infinity. So another remark here, which will be, uh, which we actually use significantly. Okay, we have a uh, training uh, set for background and we project the problem on the solution for that background and obtain, then after Lanter's transform, we obtain the tri-diagonal matrix. And we do the same for True medium for unknown medium and obtain again tri diagonal matrix. Since that grid is the same for both, right? The basis in which we obtain the tri diagonal form for background and true medium is actually close to each other. That's why uh, it's kind of important observation, and uh, I'll. Uh, I'll basically mention briefly the development related to that observation later on. So the takeaway here, um, 
so first of all we um considered the reduced order model 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 driven reduced order model but in the data driven reduced order model what we mentioned so directly from the data we obtain network type network type representation of our reduced order model and thanks to that network structure when we relate it to original pd we can train the network and embed it into the continuous space and thanks to mimicking the structure of the original pd the inverse scattering problem uh, we can actually reformulate it in the almost linear regime why because, like it's kind of loosely speaking but um, since we directly from the data we can infer that that para medium parameter sigma i and sigma i hat so we already will be working in the same space of uh, uh, medium parameters right sigma, even if we um Even if we have um, a kind of optimization, if we will perform optimization, if we will perform optimization in the uh, coordinates of the um, medium parameters obtained from the reduced other model, the problem will become quite uh, almost linear because we'll perform optimization precisely in the same space. We'll remove nonlinearity by using that map. So let's uh, move. To our numerical examples um, first of all is one of them is um, yeah, uh, electromagnetic diffusion in dispersive medium that's forward problem so here we make one more complication we introduce the dispersive medium here so we consider call call model um, which is now in geophysics it's to model induced polarization effects and materials with memory. So in the frequency domain can be uh, written, uh, the formulation can be written in this form. And we'll pre follow precisely the same way as I mentioned. So we can construct subspace, spend on this uh, solutions and formulate reduced other model in this form. So precisely the same way I mentioned. So in the example on the next slide, We'll just consider uh, uh, marine uh, acquisition. So we have this water and underwater layers and some reservoirs here. So one source, one receivers. That's just the bathymetry, like sea surface. So this is a um, logarithm of conductivity contrast here. So uh, here I compared response without induced polarization and with induced polarization. So that um, green one is no no induced polarization, no dispersive effect, and red one is with uh, sorry blue one is uh, with induced polarization effect. So although the signals uh, manifest totally different behavior, especially at late times, the convergence rate for both algorithms uh, for both for both um, for examples is precisely the same. So essentially for a subspace of size 50 we obtain the accuracy of 10 to the power minus 8 which is more than enough for all applications so if so here we considered a non-collocated source and receiver but if we do if we consider collocated ones so, uh, convergence will be twice as fast and as i mentioned so it's optimal among all time time stepping methods and all Fourier transform methods so another uh, application which is kind of uh, interesting and provides a, a different uh, like the different perspective to look at the, our, our reduced order models so essentially here we want to construct reduced order model so it's, uh, of piece of our uh, medium so it's related to multi scale methods which is kind of uh, well known tool for in reservoir simulation and diffusive problems so well, basically uh, what it is so we have a uh, medium with complicated structure then split it into parts like on a coarse coarse enough grid and each grid cell and of course grid may have a kind of complicated structure inside it so we don't want to construct conforming grid, but we want to construct coarse grid and then approximate that uh, complicated structure 
uh, a solution in the medium in the part in the cell with that complicated structure by some uh, uh, subspace. So it works well in diffusive problem, but there are issues in wave pro problems, wave propagation problems, because when we want to construct two coarse grid cells, uh, coarser than Nyquist limit, coarser than two points per wavelength, the medium, the, uh, the subspace to approximate the medium here, the solution here will be, uh, should be quite large. Basically, uh, that sort of reflects the necessity to, inter to introduce discursive medium inside each cell compared to diffusion problems. The diffusion problem, there is no such an, such an issues. So we, in, a, in our ta task, we do construct sort of dispersive medium inside each cell, but we do it implicitly, but we just follow precisely the same approach what we did before in the used other model. So we can put sources and receivers on the boundary of this, uh, our cells, just excite the field there, and then look at the response again on the boundary, and then uh, construct a reduced order model for that, uh, for that transfer function, essentially. And next step is we sparsify it using our network approach, like using methods and springs. So essentially, each cell here with complicated structure is re replaced by a set of block masses and springs, right? Like sp sparse structure, like layer structure. And then all the blocks of, of mass and springs are glued together to approximate the entire medium. Here, uh, I just plotted uh, the results of simulations, kind of synthetic but complicated medium. So it's anisotropic formation with some fin fracture here, uh, water field fracture. So here, white ones are air field cavities blue one are water field cavities. So we contract like a Cartesian grid non-conforming training interfaces, just perform simulation on Cartesian grid. And here, the result of the uh, simulations. So we compared full-scale simulation, green one and blue one, which is our multi-scale method. So clearly, dimensionality uh, reduction, I mean, can be assessed more than 100 times, although since the full-scale simulation was performed on like low order scheme, dimensionality reduction was significant, but uh, speed up was not 100, but still it's of order 10 for serial on serial computation, serial processor, and of order 30 on shared memory uh, parallel, uh, parallel machine. And it's final application. Four uh, minutes to the uh, till 12 o'clock, just a time check. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm actually wrapping up already. Uh, so, the final uh, application is uh, uh, our search, uh, um, acoustic imaging. So, uh, surface acquisitions, sources and receivers on the top. Um, here, I just uh, considered. Uh, Kind of interesting problem in geophysics, which is imaging below strong reflectors. So this, each of these reflectors, um, kind of strong, and all the linear uh, approaches, like in the reduced, uh, like in the re re um, reverse time migration, they do reproduce this uh, closest um, targets quite accurately. So all the measurements, the receivers. And sources are on the on the top surface. However, all the hidden uh, objects are totally ruined, and that's what we get using our approach. It's one iteration. We already good, have good enough reconstruction here. And if we perform several iterations, I mentioned it's linear, but almost linear, right? So it maps to inverse problem into almost linear regimes. And we do need some more iterations to improve it. So here, if we perform five iterations, so it's kind of well, very well reconstructed here. And there are some other developments. I quickly go through them. So it's nonlinear data proofs processing to get rid of uh, the inverse problem nonlinearity. So it's so-called data to board mapping. Uh, then thanks to that 
feature of uh, basis, which is very slightly dependent on the medium, where we, in which basis we have uh, the tridiagonal form, the block tridiagonal. We have data-driven approximation of internal solutions, and then we can plug it in the, into lanzer lippmann schwinger approach for inverse scattering. Then uh, all the examples I've considered in the inverse problem were related to like surface setup where we have collocated sources and receivers all over the surface. But recently we generalized it again thanks to lippmann schwinger approach to radar type acquisition setup. And although it's not related to geophysics, but I just want to mention that the same approaches were applied to medical imaging, radar and sonar imaging, propellant type gauging, gauging for NASA, and so on. And that the, to conclude, so I just want to summarize what we obtained. So first of all, we obtained a reduced order model framework for as a powerful and versatile tool for forward and inverse problem solution. So in the model driven framework, which is applicable for forward solutions, we uh, developed nearly optimal models to speed up the forward solver solution, which became optimal among all time stepping and Fourier transform methods. So in data-driven interpolator, reduced order models allowed us to embed the solutions into continuous medium, essentially to interpret the reduced order model directly without any optimization approach, or almost without any optimization approach, and map inverse scattering problem to almost linear regimes. So in numerical examples, not only confirm the same, but also show the significant improvement in image quality. And finally, you know, the future work. So that problem was uh, related to lossless medium, but we want to generalize it to dump oscillatory system of losses like viscoelasticity, PML, and absorbing layers. And I did, the problem I didn't mention before, so we can significantly speed up our linear algebraic tools because using the structure of the matrices there. Struct matrices there are tuplets or hundred cut tuplets. Uh, we didn't exploit that, but essentially, if we do exploit it, it will, significant, it will give us significant advantage of our linear algebraic operations. That's pretty much it. Uh, thanks for your attention. Um, Thank you very much. Excellent talk. Are there any questions from the audience? If you just raise your hand, uh, I can unmute you. If not, I, I'll, I'll abuse my position to ask some questions. So Leonid, said, thank you, Leonid. Do you have a question? No. So one, one interesting part that I found is that uh, I think that was slide 18 that there's no necessarily need to go to the slide. When you're reducing the problem, uh, to a network problem, which in itself is an interesting because it seems that model re reduction across all the possible applications is essentially some sort of a network model reduction. Right. But that aside, so there was no, you could essentially pick the size of the network or the, its configuration and reduce the problem without numerical optimization and it still converges. Okay, so uh, there are some, it's, uh, so if we consider just simple that one dimensional problem, mm -hmm. so it allows us to obtain uh, the medium parameters on that grid. Uh, I showed you that uh, course, uh, which is uh, fine at the measure, near the measurement point and then coursing and coursing and coursing. So it allows us to obtain the medium parameters on that sort of grid, right? So it's kind of, well, related to physics of your problem. So if you do want to obtain um, parameters on, on uh, some other grid, like for example, if you want to have some information regarding uh, the medium, uh, some, if you want to employ regularization and so on, then you, you can employ the optimization there. And for example, uh, as I mentioned, it maps uh, the problem into almost linear regime so mm -hmm. but uh, 
if we perform several iterations, a fixed point iteration, it will still be able to improve the result. So it's okay. so. And one of the examples from acoustics I showed. Let me share the screen again. So um, here. So that's from one iteration here, and that's from five iterations here. So it's fixed point iteration, quite cheap, no mm -hmm. Jacobi, no, nothing there, but it does allow you, to, since it maps almost linear regime, so there is a benefit to perform several iterations put it this way. Interesting. And it kind of, uh, so I would have expected there was another example um, I think that was slide 23. So basically where you had a fracture. Um, so I would still expect that you would have to conform to that fracture a little bit, but it seems that you can work without conforming. Yeah, that, that, that's a trick of the, all the multi-scale methods. So in, in diffusion problems, so when you have a, um, a coarse grid non-conforming to all the interfaces so it works precisely fine so we just need to compute so what, what they do they just uh, put some uh, sources on the boundary then compute solutions uh, inside this particular cell mm -hmm. embarrassingly parallels for each cell right? right and then for each source they put it in the subspace to approximate the solution inside itself so it's not linear it's not a quadratic solution inside this cell it's something which is related precisely captures the features of the solution one would obtain in, when performed full scale simulations here so it's not so it's not precisely linear uh, or uh, some easily computable function so we do they do need to compute the solution to solution inside each cell but embarrassingly parallel for each cell that's what we are doing because we do also compute uh, our subspace uh, our reduced order model projection subspace inside each cell here uh, but the difference uh, so that that's what essentially captures all the features of solution inside this cell I mean, that takes into account all the heterogeneities inside the cell all the uh, uh, all the medium contrast there. that that's precisely what allows us to capture that but we do perform one more step on top of that so once we compute all the solutions in inside each cell again separately for each cell uh, and project the equation uh, onto the solution then we do perform one more step and sparsify that projection matrices in, in, in order to compute uh, that ladder, uh, not ladder um, network that um, yeah, ladder network essentially, like um, block uh, system of block masses and springs that would allow us to uh, perform the computations on that reduced order model more efficiently, put it this way, compared to like fully uh, full matrices. That, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's fascinating. So, is there any other question? Are there any other questions that kind of monopolized a little bit? I can, again, you can either let yourself known in chat, I can unmute you, or we are going a little bit over time, so we can. No more questions from the audience? Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Zaslavsky. Again, Chris, do you have a question? No, I just want to say thank you for uh hosting this year and thanks Mikhail for for wrapping up with the last talk so I'm sure Thank everybody you. like me and struggling to get all their exams graded and stuff like that so um, what exams I'm about to give it <laughs> so grading blues is tomorrow <laughs> all right well thank you once again and again this is going to be recorded uh, posted uh, typically takes one week and when it's posted I'll let you know so you can promote it thanks thank you thank you thanks once again thank you Bye.